Hello once again, everyone. Welcome to the second part of our lecture series. We hope you're all having a pleasant day. In order to have a smooth and efficient flow of events, please take note of the following house rules that are presented on the screen and will be posted in our chat box as well. And with this, do not forget to sit back, relax, and enjoy the second part of our lecture series. Good afternoon, Rachel. Good afternoon to you as well, Zara. And good afternoon to everyone. Before you forget, we should remember that near, far, forever's not enough for me to love. No, Rachel, that's not the song I was singing. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay, okay. Let's start all over again. Okay. Near, far, wherever you are. Well, that's what I'm talking about. OMG, I didn't know you're a singer pala. Well, I only hope it did not burst out anyone's eardrums because that is the most important thing to do in today's lecture, which is to listen to these learnings in order for our minds, along with our hearts, to go on. You are right, Rachel. Anyway, with this song, we should remember not to limit ourselves on the tip of the iceberg. Hence, we should be transcending boundaries to virtual realities. As everyone here with us today, we also have different time zones. So for that, let us reiterate ourselves. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone. It is with great pleasure we welcome you all to Miriam College International Studies Department International Experts Lecture Series. I am Zara Alwan. And I am Rachel Maglonzo, your hosts for today's event. The objective of this lecture series is to understand Munir's regionalism and their implication on the global order. Previously, from the first part of our lecture series, Dr. Baugonghe from Daikin University in Australia has delivered an enlightening talk regarding regionalism in the Indo-Pacific region. So, what are we waiting for? Are we all ready? How about you, Rachel? Are you ready? I am super pumped right now, Zara. Well, it seems like everyone is at the edge of their seats to hear our speaker for this series. And without further ado, let us welcome and introduce our speaker for this event. Today, as we culminate the foreign policy lecture series, we will discuss another important foreign policy, the Europe or EU with none other than Mr. Manuel Enverga III. But before we start, I would like to warmly welcome the presence of our guest, in today's event, we have over 52 participants consisting of faculty and students from various colleges and universities. We also have participants from different government and non-government organizations present with us this afternoon. Isn't that amazing, Rachel? Our event is such a big time. It is very astonishing, Zara, how everyone is with us today. How are all of you? Did you have your breakfast? lunch, or dinner yet? Are you comfortable in your beds? I mean seats? Well, I hope you all are. We are very excited to be with you all. May we also request those who we have failed to recognize to kindly state your school or organization in the chat box for everybody to duly note your presence in this significant lecture. And with that, welcome everyone and thank you for going all through your schedules to be with us in today's event. To formally commence this event, may I call on Ms. Lorna Israel, Graduate Program Coordinator, Department of International Studies, for the opening remarks. Hello, good afternoon. Can everybody hear me? Yes, Ms. Lorna. All right, thank you. Good day to all from Manila's time zone. It is Friday afternoon here. The Department of International Studies of Miriam College warmly welcomes you, the regulars and the newcomers to this latest segment of our lecture series, this time in cooperation with the Philippine International Studies Organization or FISO. Today's topic, Europe and its regional body, the EU, is quite significant because the geoeconomic and geopolitical scenarios have changed extensively since the early days of the EU and the heydays of Europe. Today, as some would say, the world is pivoting towards the East. And the Europeans themselves have already conceded that they are no longer the center of the modern world. Nevertheless, the EU remains a major economic and trade power. It still holds sway in terms of its cherished values like human rights, justice, freedom, 
rule of law and multilateralism, which is being challenged by populism or economic nationalism. These are the external or public persona of the EU as a regional institution. The internal dimensions would include how the EU facilitates cooperation amongst its members or how intermember consensus or compromises are achieved. And this is because each member states come from different historical backgrounds and have their own uh, foreign policy agenda. It would also be interesting to see how the EU is faring vis-a-vis -vis rising powers like China, India, or Brazil, where some of the values cherished by the Europeans are being tested, if not challenged. But I'm getting ahead of myself. I'm sure our guest speaker has more interesting points to raise in today's discussion. Before you are formally introduced, let me warmly welcome you, Mr. Manuel Inverga III, or BJ, to this event and to Miriam College. And to the students, fellow faculty, scholars, guests, and special friends from the Philippines and abroad, I wish you a pleasant and rewarding afternoon. Maraming salamat at mabuhay tayong lahat. Thank you for such an inspiring and welcoming remarks, Ms. Lorna. You surely know how to kickstart our event. Now, to formally introduce our guest speaker for today's lecture, may I call on Ms. Zara Alwan to share with us a little background on our speaker for today. Zara, take it away. Our speaker, Mr. Manuel Envergo III, is the Director and Assistant Professor of the European Studies Program of the Ateneo de Manila University. His teaching has focused on a diverse set of topics, which include European politics, culture, regionalism, and diplomacy. His research has appeared in specialist journals such as the International Journal of Cultural Policy, the Asia-Europe Journal, and the Journal of Contemporary European Studies. In 2019, he was a co-author in two books, one on European diplomatic practice and the other on regionalism in Europe. And with that, let us all greet Mr. Manuel Enverga III with a warm welcome. Good day, Mr. Enverga. Thank you so much for that warm welcome. Hello. Um, let me just, um, I'm just going to turn on my presentation. Uh, good day, everyone. And uh, thank you for joining us today, whatever time zone you happen to be in. Uh, it's 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 wonderful to be here. As as um, I've actually mentioned this to the hosts earlier, this is the first webinar that I'll be doing, uh, which is rather surprising even to me. But uh, I'm happy to be here to talk about something that I really enjoy uh, talking about, which is uh, Europe, the EU, uh, and in particular how how its regionalism works. So uh, my remarks, I will try to keep them within a particular time limit so that we can we can spend more time. Uh, discussing things that, that you may be interested in as well during the Q&A. So let's begin. Um, I, I thought I'd start with this. Um, and uh, yeah, as we go along, what you'll notice is that um, many of the things that I have to say are usually rooted in some kind of story. Uh, and I think that this is important because uh, understanding details and nuance is very important in order to understand how uh, the European Union works and how how European regionalism uh, functions. It's it's um it's something that even Europeans themselves don't really understand well. So uh, I suppose a good place to start is really the 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 origins. And uh, in order to go there, like the the origins of of the European Union today, actually trace you can trace them back to the Second World War. Um, to the devastation of the Second World War, uh, in Europe at least. Uh, and that's what this image over here uh, on the left is. Uh, it's one of the bombed out cities. So many, many of the cities, especially in Germany, uh, were, were destroyed during the Second World War. Um, but there was a great deal of devastation, a great deal of um, potential economic hardship was coming. Uh, and Europe, one of the things that we like to joke about, um, colleagues of mine in, in the field of European studies, is that uh, Europe actually was interesting before European integration. Uh, and part of the reason for that is because um, if you look at all the fun, well, all the military aspects of European history, they tend to come before 
uh, the European Union. Uh, since the European Union came, there were no more really interesting wars to talk about. Uh, after the Second World War, there wasn't anything like that. Um, and that's actually, in a way, you can think of that as a marker of success. So for people who like military history, they find that boring, uh, that, that the EU has come and basically created peace in the region. But um, you can actually think of that as a marker of success. Uh, one of the things that regional organizations do at their most basic is actually to sort of unify everyone and bring different bring different neighboring states together in such a way that it becomes costly for them to wage war on one another. Uh, and this is this is an important aspect of the origins of the European Union. Um, it traces itself, um, it tra European integration can be traced back to uh, this thing called the coal and steel uh, community. Uh, 1950s, long time ago, um, and and uh, during this time, the the idea was inspired by uh, a French statesman by the name of Robert Schuman, uh, whose image is here on the right. Uh, one of the quotes that he made, or rather, one of the important historical, um, yeah, one of the important historical events that is remembered in. E when, whenever you talk about the EU uh, is this thing called the Schumann Declaration. So Robert Schumann, uh, uh, foreign minister of France at the time after the Second World War, um, he made this declaration saying that, um, that the way forward for Europe is to create an institution that would bind everyone together. Um, and the idea, and, and these are his exact words, right? So Europe will not be made all at once or according to a single plan, it will be built through concrete achievements, which first create a de facto solidarity. So the idea was to bring everything together. Um, and we'll talk a little more about that later on, but the, the, the starting point was actually coal and steel. And you're probably wondering why coal and steel, right? I mean, why not something like gold or, or something, something, um, you know, something related to wealth like that? Um, the, the usual explanation that's given for the the first, so the coal and steel community was the first step towards bringing Europe together. Uh, and the reason why they started with that is because those are the industries that are used for war making uh, in order to make tanks and, and, uh, and guns and things like that, the, you need coal and steel. Um, and so this, this is why the origins are here. And if you look at how EU uh, bureaucrats, uh, sometimes called eurocrats, uh, the way that bu uh, EU bureaucrats and even um, member state officials today talk about the EU, uh, they always point uh, to the fact that for all its failings, the EU has managed to achieve peace in a region that is not really known for being very peaceful. Um, in fact, the, yeah, so that, that's what it's managed to do. And, and, um, just as an indicator of this, um, some people disagree with this decision, but the EU actually received a Nobel Peace Prize in, in 2012. Uh, a little strange for some, but uh, at the very least, this is something that it's managed to do, right? So beyond all of its economic power and, and stuff that I will talk about later, uh, really the, the, the starting point was about achieving peace and bringing the economies together, the, in, the important industries together uh, to the point that the countries that are members of a, of a European organization would find it too costly to fight each other, right? If, if, um, if say, France were to invade Italy or West Germany, um, they would not just be destroying what is their own, but they would be, dis or rather, they wouldn't just be destroying something Italian or German, they would actually be destroying something that is their own. That was the idea behind it. So, um, and so the, the, the idea of never again, never again to the First World War, never again to the Second World War, this, this is very important to them, right? Those were very traumatizing wars. And one of the reasons why the EU exists today is because uh, they don't want this, this type of inter-regional conflict that they used to have, which was very costly in terms of money and lives and resources. <clears throat> so moving forward, um, uh, I thought since this is sort of a a way of understanding the EU um, or, or European, the European regionalism in general, what I would do is I would also throw some of the jargon at you. Um, and I, don't worry, I will define what this jargon is, but the way that um, EU specialists talk about uh, or use words when talking about the EU. Um, 
One of them is actually this idea called deepening. Um, and if you guys remember a while ago in the previous slide, I mentioned that the coal and steel community was the starting point of, um, of EU integration, right? So six countries, um, these are Benelux, Belgium, Netherlands, and Luxembourg, along with West Germany, France, and Italy. These, these were the main countries that were uh, that were that experienced a great deal of um, of destruction in the Second World War. Uh, they decided to unify their coal and steel industries, but the the actual start of the European Union um, begins in the in 1957. So if you can see my cursor, it's this: the Treaty of Rome. Uh, technically, it's the treaties of Rome. There were two, but the but we usually refer to one, which established what's called the European Community. Um, and from coal and steel, they basically expanded the area of cooperation into broader economic areas. And this is what is meant by the word deepening up here. So whenever you say deepening, uh, that that refers to um, it refers to the increasing number of issue areas at which the, the European Union, uh, the, the region in particular, um, uh, cooperates on. So the, there is increasing deepening. And this is, I, I included this phrase here, ever closer union. The reason why is because this is one of the most important phrases that's used uh, in the EU. It's, it's, it, it's found as early as their their, their first, their founding treaties, right? This, this idea of ever closer union. It is, a, it is an aspiration that they have uh, to increase the deepening, increase the number of areas by which they will cooperate with one another. Um, of course, not all countries agree with this. Um, the UK famously was a very anti ever closer union uh, type of country, but uh, with Brexit, I suppose the, their voice in the EU becomes much, much more diminished. So uh, the reason why I'm showing you this image here is because I also wanted to point out that <clears throat> uh, from the coal and steel community in 1951, you have all of these other milestones and you notice that they are treaties. They're actually treaties. The reason why is because um, when you talk about the EU, um, the EU is a treaty-based organization. It's very much a treaty-based organization. So countries agree to, um, to bind themselves to the, to the regulations of a treaty, to the, to, the, to the contents of a treaty. This is slightly different from what we find in other regions, such as ASEAN, right? So ASEAN you know, famously started with the Bangkok Declaration. That, I mean, that, that's not really a binding document, whereas from the very beginning, uh, the EU has always been about treaties. And this is one of the reasons why uh, they can have the institutional framework that they have where you know, there's a court that interprets these treaties. And if a country decides to break the treaty, uh, break or if it's in breach of a treaty, then the court will rule against a member state, right? So uh, I don't know if I have time to say this, but one of the most famous cases of this is actually um, Germany and beer. And, and um, if, if you know anything about German culture, um, beer is rather important to them. There's, there's uh, you know, uh, they have many different kinds, but there, are, there were these really old traditional laws that they used to follow. Um, and they, they created a law where they said that anything that doesn't follow the traditional German way of making beer cannot be called beer. Um, and there were other countries that were making beer that didn't follow the German style. Um, and so these countries then took Germany to court and Germany lost, right? So uh, they had to accept that there were other forms of beer out there that didn't follow their, their traditional German style, right? So th this, is, um, this is what I mean by um, treaties being very important. And if you want to go into the details of it, um, the, the, there's usually a difference. They, they make a distinction between what are called foundational treaties. Um, these are the really important ones and the supplementary treaties, which are less important. Um, I won't really go into the distinction between them because uh, it's very detailed, but um, just know that these treaties are very important. So yeah, they're, they're named after really cool places like Maastricht and Amsterdam, uh, Nice and stuff. But uh, they're, they're also, uh, they also refer to very significant um, examples of deepening because with each treaty, there is more 
issue areas that, that they cooperate on, to put it simply, um, although it's, it's not that simple. Uh, and also the other thing is um, with each treaty, um, they not only do they cooperate more, uh, you, you also have um, an increasing of the, the legal bindings that countries are, are, have to follow, right? And the, the, entire, the term for the entire uh, EU law uh, is called the acquis communautaire. So, uh, you know, um, fancy word for the, the, the entire body of their law. Now, the other concept that I wanted to throw in is this thing called widening. Widening <laughs> refers to um, uh, the increase in the number of member states, right? So uh, you'll find here actually that it went from 1957, the six that I mentioned a while ago, um, and then it started to grow uh, until it reached 28 in 2013. Uh, and then famously, we have Brexit, um, which uh, they, they set the date at 2020. But, you know, for those of you who follow the news, you'll know that this is a very long process and it, it isn't over. Um, it's not exactly over. So, uh, but for now, there are now 27 member states. Um, and it should be noted, though, that even if they're even if they are 27 member states, it's still um, quite a significant regional block. The size, uh, in terms of the, in terms of their economic wealth, uh, is is considerable. It's it's one of the largest. If ever you wanted to uh, to export anything, uh, if you were an exporter, I think Europe would be the place to go. Just because you know uh, you have a lot of consumers with quite a lot of disposable income. Uh, who can who can buy stuff that that you are selling? So um, yeah, and of course um, you'll have to in order to export to them, you'd also have to consider following EU regulations. But more on that later. <clears throat> okay, so um, I'm going to throw another word at you here, but um, this is this is not really EU jargon itself. Um, but I wanted to say that. Uh, the processes of deepening and widening uh, in the EU have resulted in a regional bloc that's liminal, meaning that it's somewhere like it's somewhere in between an inter international organization and somewhere in between. And on the other hand, it could be like a state, right? So some people say that some people like to think of the EU as like a state, but the thing is, yeah, it has some of the some of the attributes of a state, but they don't function exactly the same way. So uh, this is why I return to the point I made at the beginning. In order to understand uh, the EU, you have to look at the nuances, right? So uh, I mentioned this, the EU is sort of like a state, right? So let me give you some examples uh, here. On this upper left, you see the, the European anthem. Uh, for those of you who speak French, that's sort of um, that. And, for anyone who can read musical notes, um, you you will be you might be able to recognize this. This is actually the Ode to Joy by Beethoven from the Ninth Symphony. Uh, for anyone who likes classical music here, um, so the EU has an anthem, right? But it has no words. There's no lyrics, uh, and the reason for that is because you know, um, although the Ode to Joy, the, the Ninth Symphony of Beethoven, has wonderful words by Friedrich Schiller, um, it, those words are not used in the European hymn, in the European anthem, uh, because, you know, they don't want to appear like they are favoring one state over any other by choosing a language, right? Um, here's another one, this middle, upper middle image here. This is the European Parliament. So there's a parliament, um, but it's sort of a parliament, right? It has some power, but it doesn't have the same power as, as an actual parliament, right? It doesn't, uh, it, it's not the main creator of laws. It, it shares that function with other institutions. Uh, it, for a very long time, the European Parliament had very little power. Uh, actually, they had very little power. They were, they, they were basically a consultative assembly. So um, the EU would go and do stuff, and then they would ask the, they would ask the opinion of the parliament. Um, and incidentally, this is the only institution, the parliament, where, um, where you have direct elections to, to enter. Uh, so people can vote for representatives to go here, but for the other EU institutions, which are also very powerful, you don't choose them, right? Um, <clears throat> there, there's other ways of selecting them. Uh, here on the upper right, you have, uh, I believe this is Joseph Borrell. He's a 
uh, EU foreign minister, right? Uh, the, the technical term is high representative for the common foreign and security policy, but uh, yeah, foreign minister, but doesn't, I mean, not really like a foreign minister because he can only speak whenever there is complete consensus between the 27 member states uh, that there aren't many issues where they all completely agree with one another. So the, those, are the, those are the areas that he can, he and the other diplomats can actually operate in. Uh, there's EU citizenship, sort of, but it's derived from national citizenship. Uh, here, we have, um, we have the, the euro, the currency, right? So uh, one of the most prominent symbols of the European Union is the currency, the euro. Um, and again, it, uh, it's like a state. It has its own money, but the thing is the euro is not used in all of the EU. Um, it's, it's, uh, there are some countries that want to use it, but they can't use it yet. There are other countries that have chosen not to, right? So they are EU countries, but they've chosen not to have a euro, the, the euro as their currency. Uh, there's also Europe Day, uh, which is May 9, in case you guys want to celebrate. Um, it's, it's important as well uh, to the European Union, but uh, unlike a, a national day, which celebrates independence or, or some, some uh, sort of national pride, um, the Europe Day is... I guess, a way to celebrate pride, but it's not depicted in that way. In fact, May 9, um, the, the day that was chosen, is the day that Robert Schumann, the, in the first slide, when he gave the speech, right? So that's what they're commemorating, is the, the, the Schumann Declaration, where he said that, um, you know, Europe should start to cooperate and work together. <clears throat> okay, moving forward. Now, um, these, these two concepts are rather important to understand the EU. So we've got intergovernmentalism and supranationalism. Uh, some of you may know these, but let me just quickly, under, let me just quickly define uh, what these mean. So intergovernmentalism, of course, uh, normal cooperation, the kind of cooperation you find in places like the UN, um, it, where states coordinate with one another uh, in order to, to come up with shared, like they build uh, international regimes or they, they come up with shared norms of practice. Uh, that's, that's the sort of thing that's quite common in multilateral diplomacy, but uh, supranationalism is quite unique to the EU. Uh, and what supranationalism is, and this is why I chose this image, uh, it's where you give up a part of your sovereignty to the EU. And so the EU can then make decisions on particular issue areas on your behalf. Uh, and the reason why this is unique is because um, if you take old school like political philosophy classes, your, your Hobbes and your Locke and your, your, your Rousseau, um, they'll talk about how sovereignty is, is indivisible. Uh, the state is, you, you, like um, the, the functions of the state cannot be divided. But what the EU has done is basically taken some of the functions of the state, right? So um, whenever it comes to issues like trade, uh, economic issues, uh, things regarding the freedom of movement or regulations of products, the EU has the final say. Member states don't have any, like that is, they've given up their sovereignty on, that, on those issue areas. So this is what supranationalism is. It, it means that the EU can make decisions on, part, on behalf of all of its member states uh, with regard to particular areas. Uh, and what, um, what this means is that the EU is quite powerful whenever, it's, whenever there's trade negotiations uh, and things like that, because they speak on behalf of 27 uh, member states, which, which is where they get their, their, their um, I guess, their power in a way, uh, if you want to call it that. Uh, power in terms of uh, not hard power, but I suppose soft power would be the way to say it. So, um, the way that this is governed, right? So this this institutional structure uh, that you see here, uh, I won't I won't like go into it too too much. But um, this institutional structure, uh, let's focus on the ones inside the triangle. These are responsible for um, for creating the the laws or or the regulations that apply um, when it comes to supranational issue areas. So 
um, whenever whenever it has something to do with economic regulations and things like that, um, these these institutions are very important, right? So, <clears throat> the European Commission, uh, if you want to think of it like the Philippine government or any other government that has uh, separation of powers, executive, legislative, judiciary, um, the um, the 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 commission is like the executive. Um, they are the ones that that. The, incidentally, they propose laws, but also they are the ones that um, if someone, if there's a country that is not following regulations, they come after them. Uh, it's also from the European Commission where we get the um, the, the external action service. Their diplomatic um, representatives come from the commission. So yeah, and then um, usually whenever they make, whenever, so if you wanted to make a regulation, it would start with the commission, uh, and then the commission would then forward it to these two. So you can imagine that the council, um, the council of ministers, the full name, uh, council and the parliament together are like a bicameral. You can think of it like that. It's like a bicameral um, legislature. They they debate and they um, they decide whether or not uh, a regulation is worth um, going ahead with and. Um, just, just so you see the division of, of labor, um, the council is made up of representatives of states. So they, they look out for the interests of the member states, whereas the parliament is made up of directly elected um, representatives. Um, there, there's a bit more complication to that, but in general, they are directly elected. They represent ideologies or political parties. Um, there's some other, if, if you're looking for the judiciary, it would be this, the CJEU, Court of Justice of the EU. Um, these are the ones who make this, who, who make judgments with regard to whether or not something follows uh, EU law or not. So yeah, the, that, that, this, that's how this works. And this becomes extremely important when it comes to uh, supranational issue areas. These, these institutions are all there uh, in the supranational issue areas. Cool. Um, now let's talk a little bit about external relations. And I think I'm coming pretty close to the end of, of what I was going to say. Um, so this is actually a quote from uh, a Belgian, well, pretty famous Belgian economist, but he was also a politician. Um, and he said that Europe is an economic giant, a political dwarf, and a military worm. He said this uh, many, many years ago, but I think it still applies today, right? So um, the EU doesn't actually have significant military power that it can call upon, um, nor does it have political power in the sense that, you know, all 28 or 27 member states speak with one voice uh, in a, in the, on, on, uh, you know, issues in the UN. This is not the case, right? They, they, the foreign minister can only speak when they all agree, if they all agree, right? So this is one of the constraints to, to, um, them making coherent foreign policy. However, in terms of economics, that is where you see the power uh, of the EU, right? So um, yes, they are an economic, economic giant, but they have all, the EU has also been referred to as um, you know, a significant player in terms of, um, in terms of environmental issues and also in terms of um, development aid. So, the um, maybe five ten years ago, there were even talk. There there were even publications that referred to the EU as like a development aid superpower, um, just because of the amount that they would spend uh, in terms of development aid around the world. So uh, they, if if you want to think about it in terms of hard power and soft power, uh, the EU is definitely all about soft power. Um, and as Mam Israel was saying a while ago. They, they tend to stand for particular values. And these values tend to come out as well uh, in, the way that they, uh, in the way that they wield their economic power. So the Philippines, of course, famously has this conflict um, that sort of comes on and off. It comes back again in the news cycles every so often uh, because the EU is concerned about human rights in the country. Um, and one of the things that they have as leverage over the Philippines is a trade agreement, uh, the GSP plus. So 
that that's that's where you see this this economic power and you know uh the gsp plus it might just seem like any old trade agreement but the thing is if you are an exporter uh being able to have a trade agreement with the eu uh allows you to enter a market that has relatively that is relatively wealthy um and yeah that is relatively wealthy and because of this thing called the freedom of movement that that that's one of the most important things of the eu uh because of freedom of movement your your um your products can cross borders national borders there with no problem right so if you want to sell in france if you if you can sell in france you can sell in germany you can sell in italy uh the czech republic anywhere right um okay so uh i just thought one of the uh, a few things like just to show you um the EU's giantness, right? Um, how they wield their economic power or in, in what issue areas they can wield their economic power. Uh, I'm gonna skip this leftmost one first. I'm gonna start with these two, right? So uh, one of the things that the EU is, um, one of the examples I like to give is actually this um, product designation of origin, the geographical indicators. Um, I don't know if you know this, but like if you are a wine producer, uh, you can't just name your wine Champagne or Bordeaux or anything like that um, because the EU is quite strict when it comes to naming these things. Uh, they actually define Champagne as, as uh, wine that's made from grapes that come from only one part of France, right? Um, so they, they have a lot of these specialist foods that can only come from a certain place in the EU. And if you are from another country and you are exporting a similar product, you are not allowed to name your product Champagne or Bordeaux or anything, right? So it just becomes generic sparkling white wine, um, which is a lot less appealing, I think. But they can, th that is, you know, one of the ways that they wield their economic power. Uh, and you'd think that it would only affect Europe because, you know, you, you, um, you only, like, they can only impose this on anyone who wants to sell in Europe. But the thing is, if you want to sell in Europe, you want to sell everywhere else too, right? So if you are going to label something so it complies with European regulations, you're going to use the same label wherever you are in the world. So there, although it is for Europe um, and they can most strongly enforce it in the EU, the, the product, the, the labeling of these products, um, you know, it becomes an international thing. And uh, other there, there are other countries and regions have started to actually um, recognize these these labeling norms, uh, and they also sort of follow that, right? So you can't. Uh, they also agree that that you know. Uh, I think Australia does this. If you want to sell champagne in Australia, you can't unless it comes from you know a particular wine growing region in France. Uh, I, I keep using wine, but there's other examples too. So. Parmigiano, Reggiano, uh, cheese. There's also hams. Uh, ma many of these are foods, um, uh, but there are also other products. Um, another one, of course, is is bananas. Uh, um, just to give you an idea of uh, what the EU is like, uh, sort of in micro scale. Um, the one of the things that the EU is known for is being highly technocratic, meaning that you have these experts that scrutinize every single thing. Uh, they are experts, yes, but you know they can also be very, um, uh, yeah, they they can scrutinize, they can be very detail oriented. And um, I, if I remember correctly, this was actually this came up during the Brexit campaign. Uh, they were saying, you know, we can if we leave the European Union. The the the, the Brexiteers were saying, if we leave the European Union, uh, we don't have to. We we can finally get bananas of different shapes. Um, and the reason for this is because the the EU actually sets um, a standard for the shape that bananas can be. They cannot be too curvy, right? Uh, and they have to be a particular length. Um, and this just, I mean, you might, you might be thinking, well, who does that affect? It actually affected the Philippines as well, because we do export uh, bananas. So we, ha we had to um, follow these, these kinds of, uh, the, these, these standards, right? So this is, this is them wielding their power. Uh, you, I mean, you'd think that it would be like, you're probably wondering why do they need to do that? Uh, part of the reason is because if you remember the freedom of movement of goods, right? So you sell, if you, if you get your 
your stuff in France, you can sell anywhere uh, in Europe. Uh, that's why they need standardized, like shared standards across all countries. Um, this last one uh, I wanted to share as well. This is based on a, I actually put this in a paper uh, that I published um, a while back, but um, the, um, there, was, there was this thing called Article 13. Uh, there, was, there was something being debated at the European Parliament and, um, and it went viral because it had, because meme creators, meme lords, if you want to call them that, right? Uh, meme creators took it as a, uh, they, they started to get worried because they thought that they would be affected. Um, basically, the, the Article 13 copyright regulations, um, they punish people who, who share or who use uh, copyrighted images um, in, in their, you know, their, their social media or their transmissions or whatever. Um, and so all the meme, meme creators started freaking out because they said, oh my gosh, memes are basically you know, using copyrighted images and putting them out there. Um, and so the, like, there were actually memes made about this, uh, this Article 13. Uh, I, I wish I could share them, but uh, I, I thought it, it might be a waste of time or, or uh, you know, um, it, it would be better to spend time on other things. But um, it, it became so intense that, believe it or not, the European Commission itself had to respond uh, and say, hi, we're not banning memes. Memes have been protected for the last 17 years and will continue to be protected. The new reform, you can also uh, challenge platforms that take down your memes. So, you know, they, they actually had to issue a clarification. But, you know, the, the EU was powerful enough in, in that sense that people got scared, that the, the, they got scared about their memes. Um, so yeah, um, I, I just wanted to talk about this very quickly. So we um, maybe just uh, like a few sentences. So we know that Brexit has started um, or Brexit sort of became formalized uh, this year, January 1st, officially they, they sort of broke away. Um, and now all the borders are back up. Um, and one of the people, one of the groups that has been uh, drastically affected by this are, are European, oh, sorry, uh, British, British fishermen who used to actually sell, not to British people, but they sell their catch to Europeans, uh, other people in the continent, um, Denmark, uh, the Netherlands, etc. Now they can't sell their stuff there uh, because the borders have come back up. Uh, that's that's the recent news I've heard, but uh, it's just a it's 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 a manifestation of something much bigger, uh, and we still have to see how this unfolds. The other thing I wanted to talk about was this uh, very briefly. Uh, the EU recently has been on the news because their rollout um, has been quite slow for vaccines. Um, I suppose we would consider it fast by compared to the Philippines, but uh, by their standards, it's slow. And part of the reason why is because the EU took the lead, right? They, they said, we will be the ones to, to work on procuring the vaccines. Uh, and also because the vaccines have to clear through the EU anyway, they have to be cleared through the EU. So um, there is this issue of um, the fact that vaccine supranationalism, the EU based, um, approach has been slow. Um, and, you know, the, there, there, were, there were controversies because, you know, they, they would blame AstraZeneca for not having enough um, vaccines um, in time. Like there, there, there was an agreement and the, the producers would not be able to fulfill it. But um, this is what I'm talking about is actually relatively old news. When I checked uh, yesterday, two days ago, uh, it turns out that those the vaccine manufacturers will be able to, um, given the orders that they said that they would uh, in the second quarter. So the EU is now resting easy again. Um, they're they're not mad at these vaccine manufacturers. Um, and part of the reason why this was this was possible was because um, the with the EU taking the lead, they actually also had um, they assigned commissioners whose job it was to. Um, work on expanding production and, and um, sort of fixing the, the supply chain. So there was that as well. All right, so, um, and here in both of these, you see sort of the dynamics of um, the EU 
how it works, but also how it relates with the rest of the world or with private entities. Yeah. So some concluding points. Uh, uh, understanding European regionalism, it entails nuance and understanding the origins. Uh, the EU is like a state, but not really. Um, so as, as I've mentioned, uh, but it's very strong in supranational areas. And finally, the strength in economics uh, is, it, it is very strong in economics. Um, and, it ex and it exercises significant soft power. Um, and I, I imagine it will continue to do so uh, for the foreseeable future. So although there are rising powers um, definitely all over the rest of the world, um, the EU still has um, other, um, other resources at its disposal, uh, which we might we will likely continue to see uh, working. And I ended with this image here because um, I mentioned that the EU is about free movement. And this is, a, this is an image that I found of Europe from space. And you see that, you know, you, all you see are lights, you don't see borders. Uh, and that's sort of how I like to imagine uh, European regionalism to be. So yeah, with that, uh, I will stop. Thank you very much. Um, I, I, I hope, um, I hope that, was, that was enlightening somehow, but I look forward to seeing what you guys have, um, or I look forward to hearing from you guys. Thank you very much, Mr. Enverga, for an enlightening, well-argued, and compendious presentation on regionalism in the EU region. At this juncture, we are now proceeding with the open forum. You may type your questions at the chat box with your name or institution, or privately message Ms. Chris Hart Aguilion, the Q&A moderator, so you can ask your question directly to the speaker. If you wish for your name to be recognized along with your questions, do not forget to include them in your private messages. I bet most of you already have a handful of questions for our speaker. Uh, I would also like to ask uh, Mr. Enverga if it's okay to extend the Q&A forum, possibly between 20 to 30 minutes. Oh my gosh. Um, I think I can do maybe 10 minutes if that's all right. Apologies to everyone. Um, the schedule is a little bit tight. <laughs> Okay, th that's okay, sir. That's all right. Well, I hope everyone can squeeze in their question in that in that little extension, which is the 10 minutes. So what about you, Zara? Have you sent your questions? I have my questions, but for now, let's offer the Q&A floor for our participants. So... Good day, everyone. I'm Chris Hart Aragulon. I'll be your moderator for today. And we have we have received your questions, especially from the form that we sent. Um, for the first questions, because they're very similar, it's about Brexit. For Ms. Ergel, what's the most notable impact of Brexit on the union? And her additional question is, will Brexit be not a precedence for other EU members? Okay, um, so two questions. Um, one, one is, what, is the, um, what has been the impact on, on the EU? Um, I, I guess I'll start with that one because that, that one is more general. Um, the EU officials themselves, um, including the, the president of the commission, uh, von der Leyen, has actually said that um, the loss of the UK is, is a major loss for, for Europe. Uh, and because if you think, it, thinking not just in terms of economics, because the, the UK is quite a, a strong um, economic power, uh, it actually boosted the, the EU's economic power before. Um, now they're competitors, right? So that, that's actually a problem. Um, but the other thing also to consider is that before the EU was able to claim that it had um, it used to have two member states in the UN Security Council. Um, is it two? Uh, France, the UK, um, were, were member states of uh, EU member states, but also in the UN Security Council. Um, <clears throat> whereas now it's one, right? Um, that, that's one of the big, those, those are among the big impacts on, on the European Union. Um, and Elizabeth, I, I see your question, right? So uh, will this not be a precedent for, for other EU members? It is a precedent. So 
they they now know that it's possible to leave the EU. Um, but the general uh, consensus among member states, even those that are fighting with the commission, even those that have quite a lot of conflicts with the EU right now, like Poland and Hungary, um, even if they are fighting uh, against the supranational regulations of the EU, the consensus among them is that there is, it is not worth it to leave. Um, the, the benefits of staying are so much bigger than, than you know, um, the benefits that they would get from leaving. Uh, all they would get if they were to leave is sovereignty, but you lose so much in the process. Um, and on the UK side, this is what a lot of them are anticipating may happen, right? So yes, sure, you gain sovereignty, but you, you, do, lo you do lose quite a bit more um, beyond that. So I hope you I hope I hope I answered your question. Um, yeah, thanks. Thank you for that wonderful answer. Um, I we think that you also answered one of our participants' question about the Brexit status. Now another question is: What is the probability that highly prosperous economies will potentially leave the EU once their nations have reached? a bull market. Will there be another similar Brexit uh, event in the near future? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, it's, a, it's an interesting question. I've actually never thought about it. But um, based on what I've, uh, what I know, and, and looking again at how, how the leaders of places like France, I'm, I'm going to focus now on like France, Germany, the Netherlands, Luxembourg, uh, even Sweden, these these are places um, that count as prosperous, right? They're 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 quite wealthy, um, uh, and the although they they're already wealthy now, uh, and despite that, they have no plans of leaving. Um, and part of the reason why, um, and this is also uh, I, I I suppose I should add this. This is also why it was strange that the UK left. Uh, for people who know um, uh, about about the situation, um, most of the trade that is produced um, by wealthy countries, such as the UK or France or Germany, um, it goes into the European market. So they sell it to other Europeans as well. And so uh, to keep the, the, the wealth that they have is possible because they have access to the entire 27 member states of the EU. Um, if you leave that, you basically um, decrease the size of your captured market. Um, and so the answer to the question is actually, no, it doesn't look like it's gonna happen because these countries know that uh, their, their trading partners, their main trading partners are their neighbors. So, and they're already in, an, in, a, in a big, like very intensive alliance with them. There's no reason to abandon that. Thank you for answering Ms. Coyer's question. Another interesting question would be, how are their countries coping with the effects of COVID-19 in Europe? And are they going to extend aid to poorer Asian countries in acquiring the vaccines? And it will be nice if you would also answer, why are some Europeans are against the lockdown protocols when it is from their own good? Is it because they feel like their freedom is being taken away? Thank you. Thanks. Okay. Yes. Um, so the, this is this is cool. Um, the, the the questions about um, COVID nineteen, uh, both of them, right? So on the first question of um, will the EU share uh, its vaccines? The if I'm not mistaken, the there was already a statement about that um, that. Because like all other developed countries uh, the, the, and regions, the, they've actually bought a surplus. They, they, have, they, they will receive more vaccines than, than their population needs. Uh, and so they're going to have to find a way to, to pass that on. Um, and they did say that, that that will go to the rest of the world. In fact, um, there, there was a quote that came out recently, which was very cheesy, but you know, I might as well say it. Um, you know, the, 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 
the EU officials themselves, the one of the higher level EU officials actually said that, um, you know, the 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 fight for COVID nineteen vaccination is not uh, a war bit amongst ourselves. It's not a fight between us. It's actually a fight uh, against time. Um, so the idea being that you know, if everyone is vaccinated all over the world, and they recognize this. Um, Every, if everyone is vaccinated, then uh, it then becomes possible to reopen economies and, and restart uh, or, or kickstart the, the economic development again. So yes, the answer is yes. I just don't know if it'll come to the Philippines because there are many other um, areas that they're involved with as well, uh, Africa in particular. So I, I have a feeling that Africa may come first in, in their areas of priority. Uh, just because Africa is very close by to them. Um, the other question was about, oh, why, why, why are there anti-vaxxers in, uh, in, in, um, in, why is there resistance to, to lockdowns? <clears throat> um, there, there are many different reasons for this. Uh, it depends on the country you look at. But um, the, so one of the one of the reasons is what was mentioned, which is that um, they feel like it is an infringement of their freedoms. That's that's one. Yes, um, <clears throat> there there are people who believe that, but also there is the 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 other <clears throat> the other form of resistance comes from the fact that. Um, many countries that have enforced lockdowns, and I think that's most of the EU countries, um, many of the countries that enforced lockdowns, um, they have very high levels of fine. Like the fine is intensely high, uh, especially if you look at a place like Germany, uh, they, you have people there complaining that uh, depending on which state, which uh, particular district or, or state of Germany you're in, uh, the you know, you could you could be paying like three thousand, five thousand euros, um, ten thousand euros uh, for for violating lockdown protocols, which you know that they think that that's a little intense. That the you know the 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 punishment doesn't fit. Uh, I I don't you know I I am not a, an expert in whether or not this is the right thing to do, but um, I believe that that is the other reason why there is. There is um, resistance to this. It's not. It's not because they don't agree. Uh, it's also. It's because they don't agree with the, the punishments, the the way that it's being enforced. Um, they think that it's a little excessive. But yeah. So so there is that kind of resistance as well. <clears throat> Thank you for answering Miss Atutubo's question. Now we are lacking time, and we will be answering one question please ignore my dog sorry <laughs> so <laughs> do you think that the supranational character of eu as a region affects or has an impact in the decision making process and the politics that also happen in un considering that eu member states decide as one and it can also be connected to one of the participants question to what extent the eu model become a model for other regions in the world to emulate or follow through, similar to the first questions of decision-making process. Okay, thanks. Um, <clears throat> so on the question of um, whether or not the supranationalism has an impact on uh, things like the UN, I think it depends. So it depends on the issue because their supranationalism doesn't cover everything. It mostly covers economic things. So when you're talking about the UN, um, the UN's agencies that uh, that are about trade, or if you're talking about the the World Trade Organization, uh, the IMF, that kind of thing, the the supranationalism does come into play there. In fact, the if I'm not mistaken, in some cases, the the member states themselves don't have representatives anymore. It's the EU that represents them all. So there, you know, there's no, like the, 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 at that stage, the EU speaks for all of them. Um, however, when it's about things like politics, uh, political issues, like, uh, you know, how, how do you deal with Iran? How do you deal with Syria? 
um, these kinds of things, or how do you deal with Russia? Um, <clears throat> there isn't, uh, that's not a supranational area of competence. And because of that, uh, they don't speak with one voice. Uh, so different countries will actually have their own stands on it, and they're not forced to speak with one voice. Um, if they happen to speak with one voice, then good. They will speak as the EU, but it's not required uh, in political issues like that. That's why they say, that's why um, that quote says that it's a political dwarf. Uh, and it's a military worm because there just really isn't any, like, there isn't any EU military force. They usually rely on NATO. Uh, many of them are NATO countries, so they rely on NATO for their defense. Um, of course, that that has become problematic. That was problematic under Donald Trump. Um, but uh, I think they've sort of managed to, well, they'll, they'll see how, how by Bi the Biden administration goes. Um, I, I think I answered the two questions, right, Chris? I'm not sure. Um, <clears throat> well, thank you for those wonderful answers. I hope that our participants, Mr. Osteria and Ms. Santiago are also satisfied. Uh, due to the lack of time, we are terribly sorry that we cannot accommodate all questions, but you did answer about the involvement of Russia and other super, not super national powers. So I am now yielding the floor to our MCs. Thank you. And that ends our open forum. Thank you, Ms. Chris Hart Aguilion, for moderating this forum with us. Thank you, Mr. Inverga, for sharing your scholarly perspective regarding the EU region. Thank you so much as well to our participants for all your questions, which further enlighten our understanding of the European region. Did you learn a lot today, Zara? I surely did, Rachel. I hope you did too, and everyone who was with us today. And can I just say that Mr. Enverga's presentation is truly out of this region. You know what I mean? Wow, that was a weird statement, Zara. It kind of summarizes what I or everyone in this event is feeling right now. All right, to give us the highlight of today's lecture and formally conclude this event, I would like to call on Professor Kebert Dikayan, Senior Lecturer of the Miriam College Department of International Studies. Um, hello, everyone. Good afternoon. Uh, good afternoon from the Philippines. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank uh, Mr. Inverga for accepting our invitation as one of our guest speakers in this lecture series. Uh, thank you for sharing your time and expertise with us. And thank you for choosing us as your first webinar uh, event speakership. Uh, we really learned a lot from your lecture, especially on the dynamics of European regionalism and memes, of course. No, that, that's the favorite part from the lecture. I would also like to thank my IPPS 102 students who are behind this event. Thank you for devoting your time here. Uh, many thanks to the Department of International Studies headed by Dr. Mel Reyes and to our faculty members, especially Ms. Lorne and Ms. Clara for supporting us. And thanks to the Philippine International Studies Organization and European Studies Associations of the Philippines, represented by Mr. Inverga, for partnering with us in this lecture series. And thank you also to everyone who is here to learn with us. Thank you to the different universities and various government and non-governmental organizations who are present. We are done with our lectures on Indo-Pacific and Europe. And next Friday, we will have two events. The morning will be for the South Asian region and the afternoon will be for the ASEAN. So we hope that you'll also be with us uh, next week. No? Once again, thank you, BJ, and thank you everyone for attending this webinar. Thank you so much for highlighting today's lecture, Sir Keb. Now we will be proceeding with the awarding of certificates. The Miriam College of International Studies in partnership with the Philippine International Studies Organization and European Studies Association of the Philippines, hereby award this certificate of appreciation to Mr. Manuel Enverga III in recognition of his expertise and insightful contribution as a resource speaker for the lecture series Transcending Regional Boundaries Across Virtual Realities, given this 26th day of February 2021. Signed by Maria Margarita Acosta, 
Dean of the College of Arts and Sciences, Dr. Melanie Reyes, Chairperson of International Studies, and Sir Kev Bartlikayan, Senior Lecturer of International Studies. Alongside with this awarding, we would like to inform Mr. Enverga that the certificate will also be sent to you via email. We would also like to take this opportunity to formally thank Mr. Manuel Enverga 